How's it going, guys? I know a few of you more enlightened viewers will recognize this article from Sir Sudo's Freedom of Technology podcast, episode 11, where he was basically reading over it and then giving some of his opinions, like I'm going to do here while I also test out my new webcam. I mean, deepfake generator. Uh, but anyway, a problem with this article that I see with a lot of these articles is, uh, well, for one, it really seems like it's directed to people that don't really understand technology, but they want a quick and simple solution to get better online privacy, which is a lot of people these days. A lot of people want better online privacy because of, well, just look at what's going on with governments and corporations wanting to spy on people and know everything that they're doing at all times for all various sorts of reasons. Uh, but the problem with this article and many others like it is that it doesn't get into the fundamentals, okay? And that's something that you really need to know in order to actually have decent online privacy in today's day and age without going full Amish and just not really using technology to begin with. So that's the only real uh, red pill for privacy and OPSEC out there. It's not gonna come from a top 10 article. It's learn the fundamentals, and then start building upon that. I'm not saying you necessarily have to go and become a network engineer. You have to go get your CCNA, become a network engineer, and work in the field for a bunch of years. Although, unironically, that would be a good way for you to really learn uh, how the internet works, how networks work, how these various protocols work, which is ultimately what's needed to have privacy in this day and age uh, without being Amish. <laughs> so let's look at number one, pay for your email. Don't use Gmail or any other free email services. Avoid free services whenever possible. Uh, you pay your plumber and electrician, right? So of course you should pay for your email. Kind of sounds like boomer logic. Um, but you know, this idea is, it's right and wrong. Okay, let me talk about why it's right first. When it comes to free services on the internet, okay, free services, more than likely you are the product. When we look at these free services like Facebook or YouTube, they make a lot of money out of any data that you put through those services, okay? With YouTube and Facebook, it's everything that you search for is very, very valuable. These are technically two of the biggest search engines on the planet. So anybody who's interested in that kind of analytical data as far as what people are interested in, what people are looking at on the internet, those search queries are incredibly valuable and they sell that data to the highest bidders. And then within the platforms themselves, YouTube and Facebook, they have targeted ads that they show you, which again are based off of them analyzing what your interests are. These platforms make a whole lot of money. So your data is really, really valuable. Now, the reason why this advice is wrong with paying for your email service is that Paying for it does not solve the fundamental problem of email, which is that email by default is not private. It's not super secure, okay? And again, when you start to learn the fundamentals and you start to learn the protocols, you'll understand why. But the thing is, paying for email does not magically make it so that the person who's running your email service cannot spy on you. It doesn't magically make it so that they can't see who you're emailing or what the contents of your emails are. And if we scroll down a bit, they go on to shill Proton Mail. Okay, so now we can kind of see that this person doesn't necessarily know what they're talking about. They t and, and they even talk about this. This is one of the main things that I see people who shill Proton Mail talk about is it's based in Switzerland. The Swiss, they don't have to comply with Uncle Sam and his weird request to, to search and surveil every single thing that you do. Here's, here's the problem. Again, this is kind of like boomer logic. I feel like anybody who promotes their service because it's based in Switzerland, I think what they're, what they're thinking in the back of the mind, uh, or at least what people who are being advertised this are thinking in the back of their mind, they're like, oh yeah, it's like Swiss banks where you can hide your money and the IRS can't access that except that's not true. And that hasn't been true for like decades at this point. Okay, if you're trying to hide your money in a Swiss bank, the Swiss are absolutely going to snitch on the IRS to you. Now, when it comes to uh, data retention, there is a little bit of truth to this. So Switzerland is not part of the 14 eyes, which is this conglomerate of 
the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and most of Europe. 14 different countries. And there's also like Japan and Israel are, are involved in that too. So what they, these countries do is number one, they do their own version of NSA surveillance, pretty much every single one of them, where they're monitoring all phone calls, they're monitoring all emails, but then they collaborate with one another to share this data. Okay, so let's say that there's a terrorist outside of the United States, but the United States is interested in them. In fact, I just talked about this with um, Omnipotent, that guy who was the head administrator of raid forums. The United States was interested in him because of him hacking, well, not even necessarily hacking, but just selling leaked credentials from different uh, uh, United States corporations, like 30 million, um, what was it, 30 million people's names and social security numbers from T-Mobile, for example. That's one of the bigger uh, things that was sold on raid forums. Anyway, the United States was interested in this guy. Omnipotent was a um, Portuguese national, and he was on vacation into the United Kingdom. UK police picked him up on the request of the United States, and he's going to get probably get extradited to the United States and spend a lot of time in jail there, unless something happens to him. Okay, so it doesn't matter if something's overseas. Uncle Sam can reach his arm over and grab it. But oh, Switzerland's not in the 14 eyes. You know what Switzerland is under the jurisdiction of, though? Europool or Europol, whatever they're called, the, the basically the um, EU's equivalent of the FBI. F FBI for the whole EU. So anyway, um, they, Proton Mail, any business in Switzerland, they have to comply with valid subpoenas that Europol brings to them. And this has actually happened with Proton Mail a few months back. I talked about it on my YouTube channel and on my Odyssey channel where uh, I think it was some like French kid that was involved in a protest or something. I'm a little bit foggy on the details, but Europol got the uh, order to, or they got a subpoena. They subpoenaed uh, ProtonMail and they complied with the request. They gave them everything that they could read. So using a paid email service is not the, the best solution. The A1 solution is run your own email service. Get your own, ideally a physical box that is either in your house or it's in some property that you have control over and that you can secure and run your email service off of that. But again, you have to understand how to set up an email server properly, how to set up your email service properly and how to maintain it because Email boxes, they get hacked all the time. It's a very um, prized target for hackers. So you got to learn a lot. Use secure text messaging. This one I actually agree with him um, for the most part on. So he talks about how uh, regular text messages are usually unencrypted. Then you've got ones like WhatsApp, which is part of Facebook. So are you really going to trust the Zuck to encrypt your data? Not a good idea. And he recommends Signal, which I generally recommend as well. Um, he talks about how they don't collect or link any data to you. They do collect a little bit more data than what I think is necessary, though. So to sign up to Signal, you have to give them a phone number. And there are services like Session, which they don't talk about in here, and um, Yami, which don't require a phone number to set up. So... That's something to think about. If you're really trying to go for maximal OPSEC, um, I would say Session might be the best messaging service for you to use. But something that you're going to find, and this is kind of true when we go from um, WhatsApp or Telegram is another one that they recommend to Signal to Session. The more private these messaging applications get, the fewer features that they have. Like with Session, it's basically just text messaging. You can't really send videos. Uh, you can send photos, but they can't be really high resolution. I think you're limited to like five megabytes or something is the large, the largest a message can be on session or the largest an attachment can be. So, or total attachments, really. Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure on that. It's been a while since I've used session. But anyway, that's just something to keep in mind with these private messaging apps is generally the more private they are, the fewer amount of um, features that they're going to have. And of course, an even better solution to all of this is to just set up your own. 
uh, using something like XMPP, or you could even set up your own IRC. Use a virtual private network. So <laughs> let's see who sponsored this article. Okay, ExpressVPN has probably sponsored this. Now, <laughs> virtual private networks are VPNs, probably the most misunderstood piece of technology that people who start getting interested in online privacy um, encounter. And part of the problem with it is nearly every YouTuber under the sun is sponsored by a VPN company, which by the way, that's a pretty good rule of thumb for you to use on uh, to, to figure out whether or not you should use a service. If YouTubers are shilling it, don't trust it because YouTubers, we are charlatans. You should not trust anything that we are shilling unless the YouTuber has an Odyssey channel. Uh, then maybe they're not a charlatan, but if they're just on YouTube and they're trying to maximize their profits, they're, they're for sale like anybody else is. And uh, Raid Shadow Legends, VPNs, any of that nonsense, it's, it's garbage. You don't want it. Um, now the problem with VPNs is a lot of people feel like they need them, but they don't really understand what a VPN does. So normally when you connect to the internet, you're going through your ISP to connect to some website. We'll say maybe odyssey.com, okay? Now, when you make that connection, your ISP can see that you're going to odyssey.com. They can't see what videos you're watching on odyssey.com. They can't see what your username and password is. And it's important to know that if you're using HTTPS, all of this stuff is encrypted. Your ISP can't see it. That's something that um, so many people who do VPN ads lie about. And a lot of the time, the VPN companies themselves create ad reads for these people to read. So they're, I, I only blame the creators to some extent because I know most of them don't know anything about this technology. They don't have a background in IT or network engineering, but these VPN companies a lot of time are charlatans lying about the technology, saying that, oh, this is necessary to make sure you're encrypted. If you're using HTTPS, you're encrypted already, okay? You do get a, a sort of an extra layer of um, protection, if you could call it that, because when you're using the VPN, the ISP can't see what websites you're going to. So I guess if you're really concerned about them knowing that you go to something like maybe Pirate Bay or whatever, maybe then the VPN is a good solution for that. Um, but just to have encryption, especially protect from like hackers and stuff like that, no. HTTPS is enough. Now, even though the VPN is hiding what's going on from the ISP, as far as like what websites you're going to, this data is not necessarily hidden from everybody. You're basically shifting the burden of trust to not sell that data as far as what websites you go to. And remember, all data like this is extremely valuable. You're basically shifting the burden of trust for that not to be sold from the ISP to the VPN company. Now, notice how this person specifically recommended ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is owned by an ad company. So how much trust are we going to put in ExpressVPN not to monetize your data when they're owned by a company whose business model is just that, monetizing your data? Oh, but my VPN provider, they say that they don't keep logs. How do you know? How do you know that your VPN provider does not keep logs of your data? Have you been there? Have you done an audit of the organization? Has some other third party that you trust recently done an audit of the organization? Let's say they have, because I'm sure there's VPN companies out there that probably do, uh, as like a PR stunt, do routine audits and by third parties. Who's to say the day after that audit takes place, that the alphabet boys of whatever country that VPN provider is located in pay that VPN provider a visit and they say, hey, we need you to plug this black box into your servers and we're gonna come back in some non-specified amount of time to collect that bo black box and you are to make sure it doesn't get tampered with in any way. Oh, and by the way, this conversation didn't happen. You're under a gag order to not tell your customers or not tell anybody else that we visited here and that we plugged in this black box. What do you do at that point? Do you think, 
Do you honestly believe that because you pay your VPN provider $5.99 a month that they're going to break the law and tell you, hey, the feds are monitoring us? No. If that's legal to do in your country, or it doesn't even really matter whether or not it's legal, if they can successfully intimidate the executives or whoever is in charge of that VPN company uh, to not tell their customers, they're not going to tell them. And again, your $5.99 a month that you pay them doesn't change anything. Just like with your email, it doesn't matter that you pay $5.99 a month. If they really want to monetize your data, they will. Be wary of the Internet of Things. This one, again, I pretty much agree with. Okay, Internet of Things, all of these smart refrigerators, smart stove, it's smart toothbrush, smart whatever. You don't need it. And it leads to this concept in IT and um, cybersecurity called system sprawl, which usually wasn't a problem for the end user. Um, generally, the way system sprawl is understood is whenever you have an enterprise that's growing, they're starting to make a whole lot more money and they want to scale the business, they'll start buying a whole bunch of servers, switches, other rack-mounted devices. They might also start buying a bunch of client devices like different computers running different operating systems, different phones running different operating systems. And they want all of this to get set up and working as soon as possible so that they can scale, so that they can start making more money. But the IT people, the engineers, the people in charge of maintaining this infrastructure are not given enough time to properly understand how all of this stuff works because they've got their bosses breathing down their necks. We've got quotas to hit. And so what happens is all these different infrastructures get deployed without anybody knowing proper documentation, without anybody knowing vulnerabilities that they might have, without people knowing whether or not the uh, version numbers are secure. And then eventually some hacker exploits that and they're able to get into the uh, company. And then, well, you would have had all of your stuff sold on raid forums. Now it's probably on some other website. <laughs> um, now the home user has to deal with this as well with Internet of Things. And it's even more secure because at least with um, enterprise technology, there's pretty big risks of litigations if the vendor is being sloppy and making these devices unsecure. But with all the silly Internet of Things devices, like if there's a smart butt plug out there that somebody buys and it gets hacked and I don't know, somebody's able to film what goes on inside of someone's bedroom. Do you really think that they're gonna face litigations? No, they're not. And, and do you really think that the engineering team at the Smart Butt Plug Incorporated, do you really think that they're going through the effort to make sure the device is secure? No. So connect as few things to the internet as possible. If it doesn't require an internet connection, don't let it connect to the internet. And that also goes for things like smart TVs um, that a lot of people do have, which again, is an internet of things device that you probably shouldn't be using uh, or that you at least shouldn't be connecting to the internet. Install a trustworthy browser and use a search engine that respects privacy. And for the browser, um, they shill Brave, I'm pretty sure. Yep, here it is, the Brave browser. Okay, okay, so look. Brave probably is the best browser if you're not looking to do a lot of work to get a hardened browser that doesn't make it really easy for corporations or the government to spy on you. However, Brave does not have a perfect past. They used to do what basically amounts to URL injection on all of their users. So what this means is um, when you were using Brave, this is like two, three years ago, whenever you would go to certain crypto sites that Brave was an affiliate for, instead of changing it to say coinbase.com, they would change it to coinbase.com forward slash Brave so that if you go and sign up, they get a little kickback. And um, that's really suspect. So who's to say that they won't do something like that again in the future? But I will say as, as far as browsers go that are also reasonable to use because 
Unironically, one of the best ways to improve your online privacy with a browser is to just not run JavaScript because a lot of, well, a lot of fingerprinting is done via JavaScript. However, if you disable JavaScript, 99% of websites are not gonna work. So that's kind of the balance that's there. You could technically get better privacy by using something like IceCat or um, going on tour and disabling JavaScript, but so much of the internet just isn't gonna work for you. So uh, Brave Browser, probably the best normie solution. Now I personally would recommend um, either Firefox if you wanna go through and harden it yourself, or if you want a pretty normie friendly solution without using Brave Browser, LibreWolf, which is also based on Firefox. Now, the reason I would recommend doing this is because the Brave browser is based on Chrome. So is Microsoft Edge. Uh, so, well, they're all based on Chromium. So Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, um, and Brave. They're all based on the Chromium browser. And there's also a lot of other applications that are based on uh, Chrome. And this is a little bit concerning because it means that the technology we're using is getting much more centralized, right? Pretty much everybody is using the Chrome browser engine when there is another browser engine out there that exists, the, the Gecko one from Firefox. So I think just personally, it's good to support different kinds of technology that do the same thing. So we don't end up with this centralization, this bottleneck of one particular piece of tech, which in this case is a browser engine. Uh, and then for search engines, they recommend DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo is pretty good, but keep in mind that they have started uh, censoring what they call Russian misinformation. So uh, if you're doing any you know, political searches, because this, this basically, you, know, you can kind of take this further and interpret what it means, but it, it kind of means that DuckDuckGo like Google and like Bing and the companies behind them have an interest in shaping people's opinions on geopolitics or, you know, in their case, they want to protect you from certain opinions. Um, that's something that seems a little bit suspect to me, but luckily not all searches are political in nature. So just keep that in mind with DuckDuckGo. If you want to search something politically related, then it might not be the best browser for that. You might get a more biased opinion. Uh, and then he also recommends Syscow, Swiss Cows, which is uh, a privacy focused search engine that also blocks pornography. Uh, another pretty good uh, recommendation from me. Own your own files. So again, this one is where we kind of just get some nonsense advice because he talks about how he pays for a Dropbox account. Here's the thing. All cloud, to, all the cloud is, is a fancy word for someone else's computer. Someone else's computer with a hard drive in it, that's a cloud. With these companies, a lot of the times probably a data center, but same concept applies. You don't have control over that computer, somebody else does. So you're ultimately trusting somebody to not do spooky stuff with your files. It doesn't matter that you're giving them money. Your data is probably worth more than the $5.99 a month that you're paying them, okay? And again, there's no reason why they can't just take your $5.99 a month and then also sell your data as long as they don't get caught. So the actual good privacy solution for a cloud is to actually run your own cloud. Um, Nextcloud would be a very good solution for that. And I believe Sir Sudo does have videos for how to set up your own Nextcloud instance as well. So go ahead and check those out. I'll probably put it in the description if I don't forget. Number seven, own your contacts. Uh, so here they pretty much talk about uh, backing up your contacts from whatever um, email or whatever social media you're using, but then they also um, kind of talk about going into, well, actually that's more the next one. Um, the point that I'll make here is when it comes to social media, it's best to use something like Mastodon that is self-hosted. So it's pretty much impossible for you to get shut down because you can get banned from Twitter, you can get banned from Instagram, but this is free and open source. 
So you can trust the source code of it, you can audit it yourself, or you can just let somebody else who you trust audit it for you. Uh, you know, if you trust those people's uh, audits. But again, you need to set this up yourself and you need to make sure that you're doing it correctly. So instead of just paying some money to not deal with the problem, you have to actually learn how this technology works. Uh, yeah, so this is where we talk about own your own platform. So same thing applies. If you run your own social media, if you run your own cloud, if you run your own video sharing service, which PeerTube is a pretty good solution for that, um, then it's harder to shut you down and you can be sure that you're getting the maximum amount of privacy. However, it's gonna be on you to make sure all this is set up correctly and secured correctly. So then we talk about securing your mobile devices. So here we kind of have a mix of uh, good advice with nonsense advice. So we have good advice, um, like using a better browser, Brave, uh, using DuckDuckGo to search, keeping Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned off, don't store private information, use two-factor authentication, turn off location services unless you really need to use it. Um, and then, yeah, they just kind of say, you know, be careful about what you install, install only what's necessary. All this is good advice. Um, and then using a paid email service doesn't matter. Use your own email service. Using a VPN doesn't make any difference either. In fact, this might actually uh, be worse. This might actually lead to even worse OPSEC or even uh, worse privacy on the internet because like I mentioned earlier with your VPN, you're, they're able to get as much information from you as the ISP, essentially what websites you're going to. But your ISP is only able to get what websites you go to from your home, from your home computer, desktop, or whatever. They don't have access to your cellular data. They don't have access to um, what you search on your work laptop, assuming you're only using it in the office or when you're traveling somewhere for business. So when you use a VPN, the way that these companies tell you to use it, where you put your home computer through it, your phone through it, you put your work laptop through it, they actually have even more data on you than just your ISP does, which paints an even bigger picture of what you're doing. It gives you an even bigger digital footprint. And again, if ExpressVPN is the VPN provider that you're using, they probably love that because I wouldn't be surprised if they sell customer data. Um, and as far as what I'll add with securing your phone, so I would recommend to use as much free and open source technology as you can. That's another fundamental thing uh, that you'll learn on your journey to getting better online privacy is that if it's free and open source, or at the very least if it's open source, okay, it could use like an MIT license. It doesn't necessarily have to be GPL, but if it's open source, then the odds of it being used to spy on you goes down because if there's a segment of code that's used to spy on people, someone's probably gonna see that, okay? And then it would, it would behoove you to learn to read source code yourself and then you can check on these things for yourself if it's some obscure piece of information or maybe you don't trust the people who have audited it. Now, when it comes to using open source on a phone, that's a little bit trickier to do in the Apple ecosystem. Um, and I know that iPhones a lot of time are recommended to be more private and more secure than Android, but the fact is iOS is not open source and it's a lot more locked down than Android is. What I would really recommend you do is install a custom Android ROM like Graphene OS, uh, which is pretty much the most secure Android ROM that's out there. Or at the very least, go through different settings in your stock Android device to make sure that they are optimized, that they are hardened for privacy and security because default Android is definitely less secure than default iOS and less private than default iOS. And here Embrace Digital Minimalism is probably the biggest red pill that is in this whole article because ultimately the fewer devices that you have and the less you use them, the less information that you're putting through them, the less data that there is for anybody to gather from you, whether we're talking about governments, corporations, or some kind of hacker that's trying to stalk you and figure out who you are. Um, when you post everything on social media and you're taking 100 selfies every single day, they're all geotagged with your location, and if you've got friends, you're tagging them in it, you're creating a massive digital footprint 
of yourself. It's pretty hard for big tech companies like Facebook, Amazon, and Google to stalk you on the internet when you refuse to use any of their products or services. And again, going without these might create challenges for you, but you have to embrace those challenges. I hate to break it to you, but this problem of online privacy is not one that you can solve by just throwing money at a VPN company, a paid email provider, and a premium cloud service, and maybe a social media service that promises not to sell data, but they charge you money to sign up for it. Ideally, the A1 solution is self-host, self-setup, self-install, self-maintain. Buy your own infrastructure. Bare metal on your own property is the best, of course, not everybody is gonna be able to do this depending on how much bandwidth is on your property or um, say if you're using satellite and you have to deal with latency, then this might not be a good solution either. Uh, so if you can't set it up on your property, then going through a reputable VPS provider is the next best thing. And also when it comes to um, this VPS provider, if you want to have anonymity, then you want to make sure that they accept a payment method that doesn't trace back to you. Uh, same thing with VPNs, because there are some legitimate reasons to use a VPN. Like the, the most legitimate one that I would say is for torrenting. You know, when you want to um, <laughs> download some Linux ISOs, then yeah, having a VPN is a good solution for that to hide your IP address. But using something like ExpressVPN, which is only taking credit cards and is probably owned by an ad company, not a good solution. I would recommend something like Mulvad, which accepts cash. You can send them cash in the mail, right? It doesn't get much more anonymous than that, except maybe if you're paying with Monero. And another thing that you're going to find on this long journey to have the best online privacy possible is that you're actually going to start to become a cybersecurity expert because that's pretty much what it takes to have excellent privacy in today's world, at least without going full Amish. Anyway, leave a like and a comment on this video to hack the algorithm. Follow me on Odyssey, which is linked in the description, and have a great day.